I am Nishimura from Shimazu Corporation. The title of my talk is Dealing with Data Integrity. I will essentially be describing how to approach the requirements of inspection authorities and how to respond to those requirements. The talk after mine will introduce Shimazu's practical solutions to dealing with the topics and problems that will be raised during this seminar. You have already heard the definition of data integrity and what the guidance has to say on data integrity, so I will not repeat that information. Although calling data integrity a buzzword may seem strange, it is a topic that has been attracting attention in recent years. Data integrity is said to be a new problem that has been around for some time, and in recent years, its appearance in FDA warning letters has increased greatly. The MHRA, FDA, and WHO have successively issued guidance on data integrity, with the most recent one issued by the MHRA in July 2016. While the issued guidance appears new, the content mostly deals with matters already covered by past legal requirements, such as those of CGMP and Part 11, and it introduces no entirely new concepts. As for FDA warning letters, they tend to note problems related to record-keeping by laboratories based on CGMP Part 211.194 laboratory record. This topic is obviously not at all new. If you attempt to pursue the question of in what direction current surveillance is heading, one topic that comes to mind is how the reliability of operations is guaranteed as a whole. As for the current situation with regards to the FDA and various EU authorities, some things are regarded as prerequisites. These include both computer systems and features of computer systems required by Part 11 and Japan's ERES guidance that must be implemented properly. If the computer system features described in Part 11 and other guidelines are in place, we might assume the data being recorded are properly protected. However, the prevailing perspective on data integrity is if incorrect data are recorded, that recorded data are fundamentally meaningless. In other words, if correct data are not recorded, all activities are suspect. The reason for an increasing number of comments related to laboratory records is probably due to reliability not being ensured in this area. Consequently, what is important is not simply the computer system and its features, but what kind of information and data are entered into the computer system. This is currently an area of intense interest. So for data integrity, the current approach to auditing is not to assume that purchasing a computer system and investing in a system will be the solution to data integrity. This is represented simply in the figure on the right. Basically, the main challenges to achieving data integrity are to decide which analyses to perform, by what procedure to perform them, and to stipulate those things effectively in SOPs. Then, to decide to properly protect the data created in conformance with these SOPs within a computer system. And to decide to properly ensure the total integrity of that data based on using the data on the computer system via a life cycle of data generation, change, retention, and disposal. Moving on to some specifics, I would like to introduce three major areas in which authorities are currently showing particular interest. The first area is whether a testing manager is checking the audit trail properly for a batch or sequence, and whether checking activities are performed according to a proper framework. The second area concerns trial injections. This is probably because trial injections are often performed in advance of proper analyses with HPLC and other analytical systems. Trial injections themselves are not wrong. 
Authorities are interested in whether trial injections were performed based on formalized rules and established SOPs, and whether the operating status of trial injections is being checked. The third area is that, while approval is provided on paper in many cases, authorities are interested in whether paper reports and their associated electronic records can be properly identified and how the auditee guarantees those electronic records are truly the latest versions. I would now like to describe the background to these observations. In the process, I will be going through three actual FDA warning letters. The first example is a letter dated June 16, 2014. Looking at just the most important part, the FDA noted batch samples were retested until an acceptable result was obtained. Looking in more detail, an analysis was being repeated multiple times. The operator watched the chromatogram as data was displayed, and if it did not meet their expectations, they pressed a button that stopped the ongoing analysis and then repeated the analysis. The operator continuously repeated the analysis until the desired result was obtained, so the analysis was repeated many times, with only the best result being used. This way of performing analysis is extremely poor. The FDA commented that any data obtained in this way could not really be trusted. The second letter is a problem commonly encountered in trial test injections. A folder not approved by the QC personnel was created on the computer system without permission. The folder had the name WASH, and out of specification or OOS data present in the WASH folder was subsequently not investigated or reported. The WASH or trial injection folders were created without permission, and data that should have been used for test results or otherwise handled as OOS data were ignored. Analytical results were hidden intentionally, since if results obtained were no good, that analysis was treated as a trial injection. Only data that suited the needs of the operator were selected. The letter commented that such behavior had become established practice at the company. The third letter is similar to the previous two. The results obtained from trial injections were not reviewed or evaluated in deciding a batch release. The topic of the second letter was an absence of established rules for trial injections, while in this case the FDA commented the results of trial injections were not reviewed or checked properly. My interpretation is the FDA in all three letters is commenting not on the features of a computer system, but by what procedures quality control is being implemented in work operations, and whether the testing manager or the organization as a whole is checking those procedures. This is the reason for my earlier statement that simply buying a computer system will not ensure data integrity. Earlier, I said computer system features were a prerequisite, but it is my understanding that in the future, Quality control activities will require a proper combination of computer system features and established operational practices. I have drawn out a rough workflow based on this idea. First, a clear procedure for the creation of correct data is established. This is pretty obvious and is the SOP. Then, correct data are recorded into a computer system in the course of activities. This data are maintained in a protected state that allows for proper confirmation. The procedures up to data entry will be defined clearly in SOPs, as is expected. The entered data are then checked for correctness. This is the relatively difficult part, to confirm for sure not only the procedures for data entry, but also whether the entered data are correct. This confirmation must also be formalized as a procedure. Then, the data that are confirmed to be OK are recorded into the computer system and protected by the system. The data should be protected in a way that does not allow modification. Finally, looking further ahead, 
while it is actually quite simple to create these SOPs, integrating them into normal practice is another topic entirely. The need soon arises for a system that confirms the correct execution of already established SOPs, either by regular self-assessment or by having a third party in the role of an internal audit department or quality assurance department check the execution of the correct practice in some way. The blue areas on this figure are the parts that can be performed by a computer system, while the areas inside red lines are so-called operational areas that absolutely require procedures or an organizational framework for implementation. The image shows how difficult it is to implement everything using only computer systems. So why can't a computer system guarantee all aspects of data integrity? Well, what is a computer system anyway? Computer systems have their own fundamental characteristics. The most prevalent of these are not that they are not particularly smart. They basically repeat the same tasks and they do what you tell them to do. Computers are not yet designed to make independent judgments and implement analyses based on those judgments. This will probably change in the future with the development of artificial intelligence, but at present, the basic characteristics of computer programs are that they repeat what you tell them to over and over. In the normal course of work, a keyboard and mouse are first used to enter various kinds of information and these inputs are recognized by a computer as a stream of signals. Second, the computer processes the inputted information based on a prescribed program or set of rules. Finally, the results of this processing are output and saved as data. This is the basic idea of how a computer system works. Computer systems are set up to output essentially the same results regardless of who input the information or where the information was input from. It would cause trouble if operator A and operator B input the same information only for the computer system to produce different results. In some cases, this fundamental feature of computer systems can also backfire. As yet, computer systems have no insight into human psychology and in the extreme cases of some people, their malevolent intent. A computer's work is to execute inputs or the information it has been given unfailingly. So whether someone makes an error when operating a computer or performs an intentionally malicious operation, the computer system will simply do what it has been told. I have introduced a red person into the figure. At first, the person enters the correct inputs according to procedure, but then decides to go against their better judgment and enters something else. Since the computer is unable to read the intentions of this person, it can only recognize and accept instructions. So, the computer system will process those instructions in the same way and output results in the same way, regardless of the person's intentions. So when we consider computer data integrity, we understand the most important challenge is how to prevent people from making malicious entries. This is very difficult to do. People with ill intent can be described as malevolent operators, the antonym of which is a benevolent operator. So let's consider people's behavior based on these concepts. Suppose a test is performed and produces an OOS result. If we base our thinking on benevolent operators, we assume people are fundamentally good. Based on this, people will follow procedures faithfully and test activities will be performed according to SOPs. And if a test produces an undesirable result, it will be judged appropriately as an OOS result. Or, if the person has made an error in her work, this issue will be dealt with according to the relevant procedure. So starting from the idea that people are fundamentally benevolent operators leads us to believe they will conduct work according to procedure and prescribed documentation. Now, if we assume people are fundamentally malevolent 
every person is malicious and will lie and cheat as expediency dictates. From this standpoint, if a test result seems like it will be OOS, the malevolent operator may decide it is in his best interest to pretend the test never happened because of the extra work involved in following up on an OOS result or loss of money involved in disposing of product, regardless of whether this behavior will potentially lead to an FDA warning. The malevolent operator will decide that pretending the test never happened is in both his own best interest and in the best interest of the company. The operator will repeatedly perform the analysis in the expectation of obtaining an acceptable result at some point. Looking at the trial injection example mentioned earlier, in which an analysis was completed but the operator thought the test result was not quite right, the operator could not repeat the test and the procedure for dealing with an OOS result seem like too much work. Therefore, treating the analysis as a trial injection was the only option that allowed the operator to avoid the procedure and the extra work of running the analysis again. In this scenario, if SOPs and procedures were written based on a benevolent operator, this behavior would go unnoticed. But assuming a malevolent operator allows for the possibility that this scenario might arise, from this point on, we will mostly be viewing situations on the assumption of a malevolent operator. We will perform a rigorous risk analysis of situations that could arise when the reliability of test activities is not secure and propose measures to counter each of those situations. Those measures will include in some form countering the malevolent operator's actions via SOPs or features of a computer system, and these areas will be considered thoroughly. A risk analysis is a very difficult process. In many sectors, such as in financial institutions, computer system security is designed entirely from the standpoint of an assumed malevolent operator. And personally, I believe the time has come for the pharmaceutical industry to take the same approach. I have written a framework for approaching risk analysis based on a malevolent operator. Topics include suppression, prevention, detection, and finally, restoration. I recommend deciding on the best measures to take in each situation when considered from each of these four perspectives. This is not a strategy mentioned by the FDA or MHRA, but a concept found in computer security that I wish to introduce to you. As an example, let's take the situation mentioned earlier in which a batch test was interrupted. What measures should be taken in that scenario where the operator stopped then repeated an ongoing test until the desired result was obtained? First, we should determine measures based on the concept of suppression in which the impulse to carry out such behavior is minimized as much as possible. In this situation, suppression is closely linked to detection since it involves the checking of logs. This measure is to make the operator aware in advance that the testing manager regularly checks operational logs, which would show if a test is stopped. Alternatively, some will consider not informing the operator of the logs to be a better method of exposing a guilty party. But if someone is told in advance they will be found out if they do something, while they may still feel the impulse to perform the negative act, they will suppress that impulse, knowing it will not go unnoticed. Such a measure suppresses the emergence of this risk. Nevertheless, some people will probably assume the log may not be checked, are confident in making excuses should they be found out, or will act on that impulse regardless of knowing it will be noticed. For these people, we employ the following countermeasures. Measures that prevent the operator from actually performing such an action may seem difficult to implement in practice, but, for example, could require test activities be executed by at least two people simultaneously. 
A lone operator may consider a malicious action that two or more operators will not, since they will be scrutinizing each other. If one operator were to consider stopping the test, he could not press the button to implement a temporary stop because the second person would witness it. Next is detection, which involves designing a computer system that creates proper logs of actions such as suspending a test. Employing such a computer system is necessary for detection. I see detection alone is something that should normally be left to the computer system. Installing surveillance cameras so the testing manager can monitor everything visually and check that a test is not stopped under any circumstances is highly impractical. Therefore, a computer system must be put in place that is able to log when an ongoing test is interrupted. Next is restoration. There will be cases when the operator stops an ongoing test regardless of the measures in place to prevent this action. A temporary stop feature itself was not included in the computer system in order to tempt malevolent action because it is a proper use in cases of operational error or to implement an emergency stop. So when logs show a temporary stop, the reason for that temporary stop should be ascertained and, if the reason is inappropriate, the test should be repeated correctly as restoration. The temporary stop cannot be undone, so the problem should be approached from the perspective of trying as an organization to prevent it from happening again. This risk analysis will ultimately mean imagining a number of such scenarios and creating either SOPs or features for the computer system related to each scenario in terms of suppression, prevention, detection, and restoration. While I have only given very brief descriptions of such security measures, whether they are in fact practical to implement, of course, depends on a variety of factors, such as cost and structural issues within the organization and staff. I have presented just one example. What measures are actually implemented and to what degree they are implemented are to be examined and decided by each individual pharmaceutical business. I would like to describe in more detail measures against the three warning letter examples mentioned earlier. In the instance when the operator repeated a batch analysis, an issue in this case was the operator had the authority to stop or interrupt batch analysis. That the operator was given this authority in and of itself was not unwarranted. There are probably cases where the company should divest people of such authority, though it may risk leaving no one able to execute a temporary stop in an emergency. It is a matter of balance deciding who to give authority to, to what degree, and in what respects. The problem shown by this case example is the operator used this ability to perform a temporary stop for the malevolent purpose of dismissing unwanted data during an ongoing test. I have already described one possible countermeasure against this case, which is to install a computer system that records logs of stopped or interrupted analyses. The testing manager would check all of these logs or audit trails to confirm analyses were not stopped or interrupted before approval of the test result. If such a procedure was not already in place, it would need to be added to the SOP as a task of the testing manager. However, the ultimate aim of this measure is not checking the audit trail, since stopping or interrupting an analysis may be warranted. The important question is why the temporary stop or interruption took place. Answering this question requires interviewing the operator. A computer system log will only record the fact that a temporary stop was implemented, since, as I mentioned earlier, computers can only do what we tell them to do. Therefore, you need to question the operator to find out why they performed the temporary stop and check if their reasoning is valid. The entire process up to this point must also be formalized in SOPs 
and proper records kept of the operator interview in terms of whether their actions present a problem. The other example involved treating an analysis that produced unfavorable data as a trial injection and repeating the analysis multiple times. This is essentially similar to the case of repeating batch sample analysis, since both cases can be described as an operator acting malevolently in selecting test result data on an arbitrary basis. Many pharmaceutical companies probably perform trial injections in many different circumstances. I understand trial injection itself is not fundamentally wrong, but the operator used the trial injection system in a malevolent fashion in this case, and this behavior should be stopped. It is, of course, important that proper trial injection SOPs are established when checking the audit trail for stoppages or interruptions in analysis. There is also the question of whether to permit trial injection at all. I think it should be formalized in a set of rules as to when trial injection is allowed and what to do when a trial injection is complete. Also, since trial injection is performed prior to actual analysis, a rule is needed that states this definition cannot be modified and an actual analysis cannot be called trial injection after the fact. This should be implemented alongside features in the computer system, such as having a comment section for the operator to name a trial injection before starting the analysis, or including the words trial injection in the sample name. If implemented via the computer system prior to analysis, these matters cannot be changed following the analysis and can therefore be introduced to identify whether an analysis is a trial injection. It is probably also a good idea to establish the process of checking periodically whether data identified as trial injection data were originally planned to be trial injection data. One more matter that is not strictly an FDA warning letter comment, but is something often said during inspections. Recently, there have been increasing requests for the auditees to link their paper reports and electronic records properly. So, please make sure paper reports and their associated electronic records can be linked and identified together. Auditees are also questioned on whether paper reports are guaranteed to contain the latest data and match up with electronic records and other data entered into the computer system. Of course, ensuring paper reports match electronic records should be enabled in the features of a computer system and is a prerequisite of data integrity. It is theoretically possible to falsify a paper report without accompanying electronic data. Recent sophisticated computer system software, such as Photoshop, makes this a credible problem since someone can quite easily recreate documents based on a past document template. One more point is that while printed paper documents can only be printed at a particular point in time, it is theoretically possible to reanalyze data and edit data after the relevant paper document is printed. In this scenario, the paper report already checked by the testing manager may not, in fact, contain the most recent data. I have heard of cases where authorities have questioned an audit D about whether this matter is properly controlled. It goes without saying that paper reports can be linked to electronic records. Of course, computer systems must also output paper reports with information that immediately allows us to identify specifically what data they contain. This is something that should be guaranteed by features of a computer system. While difficult, when a testing manager finally approves test results on a paper report, they should also confirm on a moment-to-moment -moment basis that data present in the computer system match the data present on the paper report. If this is not done, they cannot guarantee that data entered into the computer system are the same as that present on the report, whether the paper report has been falsified, 
or whether the paper report really contains the latest data. The paper report may have been printed arbitrarily during testing when it suited the operator and must be referenced against electronic records by the testing manager. I think it is necessary to create and execute an SOP that contains this check and records when this check has taken place. I have broadly covered three case examples and the measures taken in each. I introduce use of paper documentation, so I would also like to describe an approach to data integrity as related to paper records. The issued guidance mentions data integrity where data is not limited to information in electronic records. Data is used to also refer to paper materials. Therefore, it is too early to assume the topic of data integrity does not apply in situations that do not include computer systems. When approving paper reports, the information displayed on the paper is generally treated as electronic data converted to a format easier to read for humans. As noted on the right, computer systems essentially operate in a world of ones and zeros. All data on a computer system are represented in terms of ones and zeros, and it would be near impossible for a human to make an immediate decision based on those ones and zeros. A paper report is a necessary representation of information present in those ones and zeros. Shimanzu's software is designed to output a report containing only the items required, such as the information of the analyst, or only chromatographic profiles. Therefore, even when confirmation occurs at the paper document level, electronic data should be considered the origin of that paper document, and indeed of everything. This perspective leads us to the idea that information output in paper form is not reliable if based on unprotected electronic records. We are now in an era when paper records are no longer considered original copies. Instead, we must ensure all important matters are protected as electronic records. It has become necessary to use electronic records for security, even when paper is used practically. Nevertheless, I have recently realized that on reaching this point, continuing to work with paper copies is difficult. When paper reports are used as original copies of electronic records, if an inspecting authority is told approval is performed via paper records, they may still request to see the electronic version of the same records. It is a lot more time-consuming to demonstrate consistency across series of documents than to simply demonstrate the procedures used to maintain consistency between paper records and electronic records, or how they are approved. It also increases paper usage. So, while earlier I proposed that paper reports be checked against electronic records to ensure they contain the latest information, if we assume this is already done, the most effective solution may be to employ electronic signatures for electronic documents from the time of their creation. This will reduce paper usage where allowed, guarantee the latest data, and associate signatures with records. This is the course of action I recommend be adopted going forward, and is also the way things seem to be developing. Saying that, Authorities currently do not always require electronic signatures, so it is up to you how to proceed, though we have certainly reached a time when doing everything on paper is very difficult. Today, I describe my opinions on data integrity inspections and how to deal with them. The way inspections are going, data integrity cannot be guaranteed simply by telling the authorities a computer system has been introduced or by explaining how it has been used. Recently, inspection authorities are asking companies how they ensure the complete reliability of all test activities. I have been discussing the topics of malevolent operators and human behavior, and the same ideas are mentioned on the British MHRA website under the phrase personnel integrity. The MHRA 
says that restricting or guaranteeing human behavior is a difficult topic and recommends trust but verify. This translates to assuming that while people are essentially benevolent operators and will generally do things properly, their actions must be examined carefully by a third party, such as a testing manager. The MHRA indicates that adopting this perspective will probably allow you to guarantee data integrity. Directing the malevolent intent of an individual with authority in a desired direction is a difficult task. Workflows and SOPs must be created based on how an organization can curb malevolent behavior and guarantee the reliability of all test operations. That is the end of my talk, but the next presentation will cover some of Shimazu's actual simple solutions for dealing with inspections from a functional perspective.